Some of its teams date back to before Confederation, and its championship cup is second only to Lord Stanley's in this country's sports pedigree. The Canadian Football League has so much more competition for the sports dollar these days, so it may not be the dominant force it once was, but it still thrills fans from British Columbia to Montreal. Joining us now for more on where the league stands today, the commissioner of the CFL, Randy Ambrosi. It's good to meet you finally. Great, Steve. Nice to, uh, nice to be here. Thank Happy you. Happy to have you here. I want to start. I'll fess up. This is kind of cheesy off the top here, but you ready? I'm ready. See that monitor up there? Take uh, a look up okay. there. Who is that guy? Yeah, <laughs> with the glasses. <laughs> what year was that, you know? You know, that would have been probably 1993, uh, somewhere between 89 and 93, but I, I started wearing glasses because I didn't like uh, the way contacts felt in my eyes, and then I got a lot of, uh, a lot of abuse from my teammates and, and a, a little bit from the competitors who wondered. I look like, more like an accountant than I did an offensive lineman. You look fairly ferocious there, I have to say. You know, like pull, pull yeah, blocking for yeah, somebody or yeah, yeah. something at that point. You did nine years in the CFL. I did. You're a great cup champion. Yeah. What do you remember most fondly about that championship season? Oh, there's so many things. You know, they're, um, you know, one of the most, one of the relationships that I had during the, my playing years was with Coach Lancaster. And we should um, just say, this is the little general, Ron Lancaster, yeah, that's right. 20 years in Saskatchewan, yeah. and head coach of Hamilton. Once he was a time. remarkable person. Mm -hmm. And uh, during my time in Edmonton, when he was coaching there, we became friends. And in 1993, I got hurt. Uh, I'd, had, uh, I'd had my knee reconstructed, and I got hurt again. And I was thinking, uh, the doctors were thinking about doing a surgery, and that would end my season. And he actually asked me not to. He asked me to hold off. and do treatment and train and, and rehabilitate. And he said something that has never left me. He said, Randy, I believe if you're playing, we're gonna win the Grey Cup this year. And, uh, and I trained harder probably than I ever had in my life and came back and got back early enough to get a couple of regular season games in. I was taped from basically the top of my, top of my thigh right down to my ankle. And uh, we went on to win the Grey Cup. And, you know, he came to my locker. We were sitting in the locker room after the 93 Grey Cup. And he came uh, to sit next to me. And uh, he put his arm around me and he said, kid, I told you so. And, uh, and that's one of my, my all-time favorite uh, recollections of that year. That's a nice moment. You are, you are kind of, well, I think probably unprecedented in as much as you're the commissioner of the Canadian Football League. But were you not the head of the Players Association once upon a time, too? Well, I wasn't the head of the Players Association, but I was the, that was the secretary on the Players Association, so I, I served on the Players Association for, for several years while I played. Like, that's kind of both sides of the fence. It how is. exactly do you... <laughs> how, how do you ensure that both sides see you as an honest broker, given that, you know, once upon a time you represented one, now you're representing the other? Yeah, you know, I think uh, Stephen Covey famously said, yeah. first seek to understand before you seek to be understood. Huh. And I try to, you know, I try to use the fact that I can understand the player's point of view. I try to have, be, I try to have that empathy for their player, for the player's point of view. But I also know that I represent the the teams and the owners in the Canadian Football League. And as long as you have that consciousness every day when you get up, uh, things can go pretty well. A little nasty question here: Do the former players that you either played with or you work with on the association, do they see you at all as a turncoat now that you're working for the owners? I've been with several of them. I don't think the word turncoat has come up, but okay. who knows what they're thinking. No, I think everyone's pretty, um, everyone's pretty cool with this. And look, for the longest time, the relationship between the players in this league has been a positive one. I don't see any reason why that's ever going to change. We're all in this together. We all want to grow the game and make it bigger and stronger. So when you have that, you know, those shared goals, it's easier, it's easier to work as partners. Okay. I've been going to CFL games since I was eight years old, okay? I, and Hamilton Tiger Cat games, of course, at Civic Stadium once upon a time. Then they called it Ivor Wynn. Now at the Donut Box, Tim Hortons Field. I love the CFL. There's no issues there. But not everybody's like me. And, um, well, sometimes uh, American TV producers have a lot of fun at the CFL's expense. Here's a clip from Family Guy. Sheldon, go. We now return to Hard Knocks CFL, training camp with the Toronto Argonauts. I hope you make it. You're real good. No way, not as good as you. I hope you make it. What are you going to do with all your money? Oh, probably just save it. Yeah, that's real smart. Well, back to my book. <laughs> does, does that help or hurt the CFL have the image in the United States that it wants to have? Well, first of all, I'm wondering what image that is creating, so I'll have to reflect <laughs> on that first. Uh, oh, look, 
I uh, think that's funny, and uh, I think uh, qu one of the quintessential Canadian uh, qualities is that we can laugh at ourselves, right? Mm -hmm. And we're uh, we're good natured, so I'm going to take that in that uh, spirit. But look, I think in some respects, the message that I've been sharing publicly and within. Uh, with the governors and even with the players is it's our time. It's our time to think about ourselves differently than we might have in the past. It's, and what does that mean? It's bigger. It's it's a, it's reimagine ourselves in a in a whole different in a whole different scale. It's thinking about not so much this great national Canadian Football League, but an international version of ourselves. And we've been talking about sports and look at hockey. Hockey 1972. Hockey's big in Canada. Before we play the Russians, hockey got bigger after. Why? Because we realized there was a whole big hockey world out there that we weren't participating in. And now look at the NHL today as an example. Look at the Ryder Cup that was just played, how big that sport has become and, and on the tours, how many players, you know, come back and forth across the pond and around the world to, to compete with one another. That's the Canadian Football League we need to become is a big international game. We should be second fiddle to no one. And we should we should reach out to the best players in the world and have them play here in the Canadian football. Okay, League. but to that end, like the NFL kind of beat you to the punch, right? They've been in Mexico for years. They've been in London, yeah. England for years. I know you want to be in places like that, but is it too late given that <clears throat> all these other countries now know American rules football, yeah. not ours? First doesn't mean best. And the fact is, and this is the interesting reality that the skills that it takes to play the game of football, whether it's three downs or four downs, the skills are identical. Blocking and tackling, catching and throwing, and running fast, right? Mm -hmm. Those things are absolutely universal in the game. I'd like to give the people around the world an opportunity to see the CFL, to see how fast and fun it is, to see how, how, um, how energizing our brand of football can be. But you know what? I can bring a player, and we hope to bring many players from around the world to enjoy our game. We hope that their countrymen will want to watch their, you know, watch their countrymen play in this league. Canada's right now the reputation index, the world reputation index. We are the number one. We have the number one reputation in the world. I think you know Canada's star is shining. We should get out there and welcome the world as we all so often do, and have great players come and play here, and get the world to come and watch. You want to be back in the States? You know, I, I'm, this is for me not a U.S. issue. This is a global issue. There are now 30 countries around the world that are playing gridiron. Uh, the game is very big in countries like Germany and Austria. It's huge in Japan. Um, we're having a conversation in Mexico right now where I was just there and I was blown away by how big football is in, in Mexico. Which means if you do put teams into these places, they will not necessarily have Canadians playing for them. And that was certainly an issue when the expansion of the United States happened, whenever it was, 25 years ago or so, is that you had teams fully of American players playing teams that were mostly of Canadian players, but also with Americans. And that's, I don't know, that's not a fair contest, is it? Well, it's actually not the model we're aspiring to, to put teams there. What we want to do is bring the best players from those, uh, from those leagues that are playing outside of North America and invite them to come here. That was the essential starting point for this international CFL 2.0 idea, was go get the best players from around the world and have them come and play in our great league. We'd like to also grow the game in Canada, so we're talking about an opportunity to send Canadian college athletes or junior athletes who are looking to con you know, continue to develop their skills and have them go play in those countries. So create a two-way exchange of players uh, where we get the best that the world have to offer and Canadians have more opportunities to play the game. We think that can be great. Maybe over a period of time we play some games in countries outside of, the, outside of Canada, but, but doesn't necessarily mean having teams there. But who knows, maybe in stage two or stage three, all of that changes. But for now, we're going to make this game bigger. We're going to become an international Canadian Football League. We're going to welcome the world into Canada. We think that's going to help attract fans in our biggest cities and our and our and and on all of our cities. Well, before you go to London or Mexico, don't you have to go to Halifax first? Well, we're working on Halifax as well. You know, you have to work at... Um, you know, think about these parallel paths. So Halifax, for sure. Look, it's been the unfinished piece. Steve, you're a big CFL fan. It's been the unfinished piece of business yep. for this league for as long as guys like you and I can remember. It's kind of like having a national railway that doesn't go coast to coast. It's not really a national mm -hmm. railway. 
And I think that's the, the, final, the final stretch of track for our league to extend that metaphor is to get that team in Atlantic Canada and welcome, officially welcome Atlantic Canada into the Canadian Football the League. The last spike into Halifax. Absolutely, yeah, go. it'll be the, gold, okay. the golden spike. That's on the field stuff. I want to talk to you a bit about off the field stuff. And uh, I, I mean, certainly in the National Football League, it has been a, a, a domestic violence has been a real issue. I don't think anybody watching this who saw the image of, of Ray Rice, the running back in the NFL, uh, beat his significant other into uh, unconsciousness can ever forget that video. Um, I want to take a look, just before I ask you a question about this, about uh, the British Columbia Lions and some of the headlines they've made uh, by trying to get people to be more aware of these issues. So, Sheldon, go ahead, roll that clip. An incident occurred in my own house that I had to deal with, and uh, fortunately for me, I was old enough that I could deal with it on my mother's behalf. That's why we've partnered up with the Ending Violence Association of BC to begin to create a positive change. Tell him to stop, distract him, change the subject. Talk about it with them later. Talk about it with her. Make sure she's okay. Tell someone else. These are just a few ways to stand up and be more than a bystander. Break the silence on violence against women. Okay, so that's obviously a very worthy initiative that the Lions are taking on. And that is an impression I'm sure you want to be associated with the CFL brand. Having said that, you know, and you've heard this before, but Johnny Manziel's a very uh, talented player. He's a very high-profile player. He didn't make it in the States. Came up here, had some issues around domestic abuse. CFL signed him up anyway. Mixed messaging? You know, I could see how people could feel that way, but what I would want them to know is that we brought in experts, including uh, our friends at Ending Violence, to help us understand what Johnny's situation was. And you have to almost look at every situation, you know, through its own lens because they're all different and unique. We've actually created a process of doing the evaluations that includes, you know, psychological evaluations, uh, uh, interviews with experts in the field so they can tell us where somebody is in their journey. We're all going to have times in our lives where we're going to make mistakes. Um, the question we have is, is this player done, have they, after doing the wrong thing, have they done the right things? Are they on a path to being someone that can make a contribution to not only to a football team, but to a community that they're going to live in? Is you're satisfied be... Menzel has. Yeah, and, and, but more importantly, Steve, it's not really important that I, that I believe that. It's that I rely on experts who have specific knowledge. Look, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm well studied in, in business and finance. I think I know a little bit about football, but I'm hardly an expert. At, uh, at, at the whole, in areas of psychology and violence against women. So you know what I do is say, don't rely on what I know. Mm -hmm. Rely on experts. And so the experts said, look, we think he can do this. There were, some, there were some specific provisions installed, conditions that he would have to meet that the experts told us would give us a much better likelihood of having this be a positive story. And he's so, doing that? And yes, and, yes, he, okay. and those conditions are ongoing. And, and he's following them. Let me ask you what the experts are telling you on the issue of what is now a legal product. Should CFL players be allowed to smoke grass? Well, again, it's, uh, you know, there's so much being talked about and thought about, in, not just in sports, but in industry. What's the, how are, you know, there's heavy equipment operators that are, that are working on construction sites around this great country of ours. There's athletes playing sports. There's people doing important jobs. And what protections will we put in place and should we put in place as a society? Do you think you need to as a league? Well, you know, look, we're studying the question. We're talking with experts. A an area of, um, that's been of interest to us is the medical marijuana question. Mm -hmm. It's been there because we also, we obviously have players who get injuries. And the questions that we're asking our doctors, and we have, have world-class doctors serving on our teams. We're asking our doctors what role could mar medical marijuana. We're looking at this opioid crisis, recognizing that um, opioids have destroyed lives and created addictions and and um, and been a blight on society. So, is there at some point going to be a more heavy reliance on marijuana as a medical marijuana as a solution for pain management? 
These are all important things, but again, the reason you ask experts and invite experts in is because they know more than you do, otherwise they wouldn't be experts. Okay. Well, here's something theoretically you should know more about than maybe the experts, because as an ex-player, you, know, you may have had some experience with this, uh, and we're talking head injuries right now. Okay. And here's how the Canadian press uh, last year reported on some of your first responses to the issues of head injuries. Uh, here we go. Sheldon, bring this graphic up. The CFL may have a new commissioner, but the league's position on whether football head injuries are linked to brain disease hasn't changed. There isn't enough evidence to confirm the connection. We know there are football players that have had CTE, said Ambrosi. That's you. It's a terrible thing that we're not going to dispute. We have to follow the science, and the science is inconclusive. The cause and effect is unclear. It just simply is. It's not a position the NFL shares. In March 2016, Jeff Miller, the NFL's top health and safety officer, acknowledged the link during a discussion on concussions convened by the U.S. Congress. It marked the first time a senior league official conceded football's connection to chronic traumatic encephalopathy, or CTE. How come the NFL can go there, but you can't? So, Steve, the other side of the, of the NFL story is that the NFL actually uh, rescinded that, uh, that statement uh, that, uh, that they made in Congress. They actually clarified that statement uh, after the fact. I bet the lawyers made them do that, but the VP for Health was yeah. pretty clear about it. So, here's the good news. The good news is that, maybe, maybe even the phrase good news is, uh, is in, inappropriate, but the, the, for me, it's a journey. I think uh, what I'd say is we're not afraid of the truth, Steve. We're running towards the truth. That's we're, not what the lawyers say, Commissioner, I have to tell you. They yeah. say that you don't want to make the acknowledgement because you're afraid Well, of I'll tell you why, because I just attended a conference in London uh, just two weeks ago, and I was listening to some of the foremost experts in the world who are telling us that they don't know. Uh, these are brain scientists. These are, these are remarkably well-respected scientists from around the world who are saying they don't know. There are so... There's so much more that we have to learn about the issue. Look, there are studies out there that have reached that conclusion. There are studies out there that have said that that conclusion is, is incorrect. Uh, Lily, uh, Dr. Lily Naz Harati, who wrote us, there was an article here in, in uh, the newspaper in the Star, I believe, a few months ago, where she chronicled a, a woman who had, n had no history of sports, no history of car collisions, and anything, she's got CTE. and she has CT. Yeah. And, and Dr. Hazaretti, who's an amazing scientist, said, "We don't know. We don't know why she ended up with CT." So, now, how many concussions did you have as a player? You know, I, to, to the best of my to recollection, I had one. I actually had it in college, not mm -hmm. in not in in the CFL. But this is exactly why we've done things like taken padded practices out of our out of our league, so that during the regular explain season, that. explain what that means. Yeah. So yeah. for you know, we met with the player association last year, and uh, in a what I thought was an amazingly collaborative conversation, talked about you know how do we do everything possible to reduce the chance of injuries amongst our players. And so we agreed that we would go to a 21 week season, which would give the players more rest. We talked about taking uh, the shoulder pads, essentially, the shoulder pads off of our players once the regular season started so that we could make sure that we reduced the number of, you know, the amount of contact the players mm -hmm. had during the regular season. But you've had no long-term lingering effects from your concussion? No. No. Well, I mean, I'm, I'm, you know, I, look, I'm sitting here today with you. I feel amazing. I've got a, I've got a great life. So. You look great. For, you're 55 and, years old. You look great. And I, and I. But hey, I, I've had a lot of friends that I played with that I care about. These are like these are like brothers to me. I do worry about it. But what I know, you see it. I mean, I, I do want to hone in on that for yeah. a second because you, you obviously having gone to Ticat games for 50 years, I've seen a lot of the players that I admired so much as kids, and I meet them now as adult. And some of the guys are not all there, right? And you've seen this too. So I presume. I mean, football's a violent game. It has to be. But I presume you want it to be as safe a violent game as it can be? Yeah, and it's, that's what all these efforts are about. Actually, Steve, I would tell you that I think we are, to some degree, living in the echo of, of a different time in sports, not in football, but in sports. You know, think about hockey as an example in the 70s, mm. the Broad Street bullies, the, 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 I mean, 
1972, Phil Esposito, the two-hand chop on Karlamov. I mean... That was Bobby Clark who did that. Or Bobby Clark, sorry. Yeah. Uh, but in, in the world of sports, I believe the 70s and 80s were a particularly violent time. Mm -hmm. Um, the highlights we showed on, on our networks were usually the ones of the biggest collisions in sport. Yeah. I can tell you personally that the techniques, it, even during my career, started to change. So initially, we taught offensive linemen to step directly at the outside eye. So that was kind of the phrase, outside eye, you step directly at them. I got introduced to an offensive line coach here in Toronto in 1987, Ellis Rainsberger, who said, no, no, we're going to go sideways. We're going to go horizontal try to gain ground. We're not going to we're not going to turn this into a collision. I want you to get sideways and then go and then go up. I want you to gain position because that's on safer. These, uh, safer but more effective. Hmm. And when I watch the players playing today, I look at Chris Jones in in the head coach in Saskatchewan doing one on one pass protection without helmets. You know why? Because he doesn't want his players relying on power and collisions to 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 win their battles. He wants them to learn how to win their battles without the collisions because he believes ultimately they'll be more effective. Okay. The game has changed so much in these past 20 years, all because that's what happens in the world. Cars in the 1960s weren't as safe as cars mm -hmm. are today in, in 2018. Why? Because we always learn how to make things better and safer as time goes on. Yes, but the players then get bigger and stronger and faster and, and anyway, it's a... It, you got to, it's hard to stay ahead of the curve, I guess is what I'm trying to say. Let me do, I, um, forgive me, I got 45 seconds left yeah. here and I do want to ask you about one more thing because as far back as I can remember, you know, there was the, the World Football League, the World League of American Football, the USFL. Almost 20 years ago, Vince McMahon from the Wrestling Federation brought in his first version of the XFL. He's going to bring in a new incarnation of the XFL. Somebody's always gunning for the CFL's lunch and, I guess, uh, to a broader extent, to the NFL's lunch. The competition is just going to get more and more intense. How concerned are you about that? Well, you always have to watch it. Uh, you know, you have to be aware of what's going on in the world around you. But, Steve, again, you've known this game for as long as I have, and you know that leagues, these leagues have started up, and there's been a lot of initial worry. And look, after 60 seasons, and we're going to have our 106th Great Cup championship this year, the Canadian Football League is still here and prospering and, and now on the doorstep of, you know, hopefully adding our 10th team and on the doorstep of, of, of moving to a more international game. So, hey, yeah, look, the competition's there, but competition tends to bring out the best in us. As a, That's the way I think the human species is wired. So we're going to meet the competition head on, but as much as we're looking at what they're doing, we have to be more focused on how do we get better? How do we grow our game? And that's what we're attempting to do as a league. Oski Wee Wee, Commissioner. <laughs> I can't say that. You can't say it. No, you've got to be completely unbiased. Yeah, this. This, is, this is one of the few things I'm not going to be unbiased right. about. I am a Ticat fan. Uh, that's Randy Ambrose. He's the Commissioner of the Canadian Football League, and we're grateful you came into TVO tonight. Steve, thanks very much. Thank you. Thank you. The Agenda with Steve Pakin is brought to you by the Chartered Professional Accountants of Ontario. Helping businesses stay on the right side of change with strategic thinking, insightful decisions, and business leadership. Are you on the right side of change? Ask an Ontario CPA.